Okay, we are in Isaiah chapter 17, if you'd like to open up there. And I have entitled this message, Remembering Our First Love. Remembering Our First Love. Isaiah 17. And we're going to just read a couple of verses here, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah 17, verse 9. In that day, his strong cities will be as a forsaken bough and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Because you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold, therefore you will plant pleasant plants and set out foreign seedlings. Now, many of you were not here on Wednesday night. I encourage you to go and listen to the message on Wednesday night where we looked at this chapter in detail and what the whole chapter is about. Uh, God was specifically speaking about the proclamation and the destruction that he was going to bring against the city of Damascus, which we believe is still a future prophecy. It's a really interesting prophecy, actually, as you tie it into end times prophecies. And we went into some of the details of that on Wednesday night. I encourage you to listen to the message. <clears throat> but also, Israel was being punished by God and will be punished by God as well. When Damascus gets obliterated, Damascus, Syria is annihilated, never to really be uh, reborn as a city. Uh, Decapitated is literally what it means uh, when it talks about it's going to be destroyed. Uh, But also Israel is going to be judged because of Israel's forgetting God. And Israel's going after other gods. And that was their biggest problem. That's always the problem with God's people is we always seem to drift back into idolatry. We seem to drift back into our old ways, our old habits. And we forget the Lord and we forget the word of God. We forget his commands. We forget that he is holy and that he's called his people to holiness and to be separate. Come out of her, my people, and be ye separate is the call of God to his people. We're in the world, but we're not to be like the world. We're not to be of the world. We're to be light in the world. We're to be salt, which is preserving, which is good. We are to be light, which is exposing what is evil. We are not to be filled with rot and leaven that corrupts uh, the world bleeding into us and then bleeding into the church, we are to be reaching out and to reaching the world for Christ and bringing salt and light and truth to the world instead of the world uh, infiltrating the church and, and really poisoning the church. But this is, this is just the, the tendency of man. We must remember our first love. We must remind ourselves of who God is. He is holy. He is righteous. He hates sin. And, and, and he is truth. Everything he does is truth. He is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. We must remember his goodness and his mercy and his kindness that he has demonstrated to each and every one of us. And we should not take his kindness as a permission to sin, his grace and long suffering as somehow uh, his affirmation of our wicked lifestyles. We know better. We're not in ignorance in darkness anymore. Come out of her, my people, and be ye separate. We must remember that the love of God brings man to repentance. It's not the judgment of God, the fear of God, the wrath of God that brings man to repentance. Romans chapter 2 tells us it is the grace, the mercy, the love of God that brings man to repentance. And that's how we all got saved, was because we saw his great love for us, his great mercy, that if God could save me and you, he could save anyone. You know, God does not want to judge his people, but eventually we give God no choice but to judge his people. I believe that the judgment of God has already begun against America. And unless there is a great repentance, the judgment of God will continue. That is the nature and character of God through all of history. If you study the Old Testament, that is how he dealt with his people. 
The church needs to come back to holiness. The church needs to come back to righteousness. The church needs to come back to a love for God first besides the love of this world and the things of this world. And we are all guilty because we've been so abundantly blessed in this country. You know, it's, it's so easy uh, to kind of put God on the shelf and take him down when we need him or, you know, keep God kind of like a break glass in case of an emergency sort of a situation. But otherwise, we don't touch our Bibles. We don't spend time in the word. We don't spend time in prayer. We don't evangelize. We don't witness. You know, we just come to church, maybe, and a lot of people don't even do that anymore, come to church for an hour or two a week and think we've done our duty. But really, it's supposed to be seven days a week that we are seeking God and we are serving God and we are putting God first. We don't belong to ourselves. He bought us and purchased us with his blood. We were bought with a price. We don't own ourselves anymore. He owns us. He gets to tell us how we should live now. In Jeremiah chapter 6, and see, this is always the call to the prophet. The prophet of God is supposed to be the one calling the people of God back to holiness, calling the people of God back to righteousness, back to fellowship and intimacy, back to truth and love and light, the light of the Lord. And this is what the prophets did. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 10, as an example, to whom... Shall I speak and give warning, the prophet says, that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. I will pour it out on the children outside and on the assembly of the young men together. For even the husband shall be taken with the wife, the aged with him who is full of days. And their houses shall be turned over to others, fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. Why? Verse 13, because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, Everyone is given to covetousness. That's like greed, wanting things that don't belong to you, coveting what someone else has. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At that time, I will punish them, and they shall be cast down, says the Lord. And here's the answer from the Lord, verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it and so the prophet is calling out to god's people to forsake their sins to forsake the idols of this world the gods of this world and to come back to him and to walk on the old paths the true paths the narrow way that leads to life and yet their response to god is what we will not walk in your ways just like they told jesus we will not have this man to rule over us In Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 4, we read, Moreover, you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Why has this people slidden back or backslidden? This is where we get the term backsliding from. Why has this people slidden back? Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to repent or to return. But I listened and I heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood. 
The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields to those who will inherit them, because from the least even to the greatest, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. He's repeating what he told us in chapter 6. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Slightly could be uh, translated superficially. It's not true. They have, they have healed the hurt of my people superficially. Not really. Saying peace, peace, but there is no peace. Judgment was about to come upon Jerusalem and the false prophets were telling the people, don't worry, everything's fine. And Babylon was at their gates about to destroy them and carry them away captive for 70 years into Babylon. He says in verse 12, were they ashamed when they had committed the abominations? No, they were not at all ashamed nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall in the time of their punishment. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. Sounds a lot like America to me. Sad to say it. Wish it wasn't true. Uh, but it sounds a lot like America. Somehow we think that grace is a license to sin. Somehow because we're saved, we can go sin like everyone else. And it's all fine because of grace. And God is saying, no, I'm calling you unto myself. I'm calling you unto holiness. I'm calling you back to myself to walk in the old ways. Don't listen to the false prophets that are telling you everything is going to be okay. The judgment of God will come upon a nation that is wicked. He must judge wickedness. Otherwise, he's not the God of the Bible. And, you know, Daniel uh, would repent in Daniel chapter 9. He was a righteous man, but he would say to God, we're a wicked people. Daniel would say this. He was a righteous man. He wouldn't deny the Lord. He prayed, got thrown in the lion's den and wouldn't deny the Lord and stood before kings and rulers uh, on the Lord's behalf. But he included himself in that when he said, we, we are a wicked nation. We have sinned against you, Lord. We have brought this judgment upon ourselves. And we need to start praying that way, guys. We need to start praying. I, I have a lot of Christians who tell me, well, you know, I'm not wicked. I mean, yeah, but, you know, God doesn't need to judge our nation because there's a lot of good people. Yeah, but there's a lot of wicked people. And the wickedness of our nation is polluting the world. The Internet is, 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 is taking all of our filth from Silicon Valley and from Hollywood and from New York. And it's, it's uh, promoting it everywhere in the world. We're influencing the world with our heresy, with our blasphemy, with our pornography and our uh, idolatry. You know, it, it, is, it is perversion that's coming out and, and rot and rebellion, our feminism and all the things destroying the nuclear family transgender, getting the kids in school and having them change their sex and the state pays for it, abortion on demand, 62 plus million babies killed and counting, how could God not judge America? We have to wake up and understand this is what's coming. And again, I believe the judgment of God upon our nation has already begun. And uh, if this election is stolen and the two Georgia Senate seats are stolen, it's the end of our country. Our Constitution will be ripped to shreds, and that is not an exaggeration. I'm going to do a teaching next week, probably two messages on the Great Reset. I feel compelled to tell you what's really going on and what is really behind this. Most people have no idea what's coming. This is all being organized and orchestrated by the central bankers of Europe and the tech giants here in America, and the corporate gurus in America to take our country down and to make us part of a new world order. And that is what their goal is. And these are very powerful people who are very, very wealthy people, the old money people of Europe and even some of the old money people here in America, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the Carnegies and these people that have trillions of dollars and control so much of the money supply and the markets and the central banks. Jeremiah chapter 9, the prophet continues in verse 1. He says, oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place for travelers, that I might leave my people and go from them, for they are all adulterers. 
an assembly of treacherous men. Remember, Jesus defines adultery as what? Looking upon another with lust, Jesus says, is adultery. Not only the act, but also the heart, the eyes, the mind, the thoughts, the fantasy realm. Jesus says it's not, you know, to, 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 to say, well, you shall not commit adultery. You know, he says, yeah, but you shall not look upon another to lust after them because then you've committed adultery in your heart. I mean, look at what we're doing in our nation with all of the pornography. I mean, you can't, you can't find a movie today that they're making without gay characters kissing each other. That's the latest thing. The Hallmark Channel's gone off the rails. They have to have a gay themed movie now. You see, this is propaganda. It's normalizing it. It's desensitizing us to this. And they're trying to make what I'm saying hate speech. I literally might have to stand before a court of law. If these people have their way, what I'm saying will be hate speech. And they will come back on churches that are teaching this and drag us before magistrates and courts because, in essence, this will be the new crime, is not being tolerant and not you know, uh, uh, speaking out. If you speak out, against the gay lifestyle, the transgender lifestyle, and say it's unnatural. Not that God can't save gays and lesbians and transgenders and everybody else. Bisexuals, of course he can. God could save everybody. He could save anybody. There's no sin that's too great that God cannot uh, forgive. If you repent of your sins and turn to Christ, he'll wash you white as snow. He'll save you right where you're at. That's not the unforgivable sin. But we in the church cannot condone these things because God does not condone these things. And God's word is clear. He says, they're all adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. And like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. They are not valiant for the truth on the earth. My goodness, I don't think there's ever been a generation that's lied as much as our generation. You can't believe nearly anything that you read online or on Facebook or on Twitter or Instagram. There's so much mass deception and manipulation and brainwashing that is going on. He says, they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord. Everyone take heed to his neighbor, and do not trust any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanderers. Everyone will deceive his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves to commit iniquity. Your dwelling place is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, says the Lord. Verse 7, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will refine them, I will try them. For how shall I deal with the daughter of my people? Their tongue is an arrow shot out. It speaks deceit. One speaks peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he lies in wait. Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation uh, as this? Because this was Judah. This was the city of Jerusalem. These were the people of God. They knew better. We know better in America. We're not Judah or Israel. We're America, but we certainly were founded on the word of God and on the Christian faith. The pilgrims and the Quakers came here so that we could worship God freely. And yet we have forsaken our first love. In Ezekiel chapter 18, the next prophet, Ezekiel says this in verse 25. It's a common theme among the prophets. He says this, Ezekiel 18, 25. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair and your ways which are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he has committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is not fair. O house of Israel, is it, is it not my ways which are fair and your ways which are not fair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent 
and turn from all your transgressions so that the iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? God is pleading with us. He's pleading with his people to forsake the iniquity and the transgressions and the wickedness of the nations around us and come back to God and to do what's right in God's eyes. And he says this in verse 32. This is his heart. He says, For I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, turn and live. But you must turn. You must repent. You must agree with God. You must confess that what he's saying is true. You must believe it in your heart. You must throw yourself upon the grace and the mercy of God for salvation and for forgiveness. If you've wandered, you must do this and come back to the Lord. I think we need to kind of take you know, stock of where we're at on a daily basis. That's what I have to do to keep my list short of the sins that I commit against God every day. Uh, and we shouldn't use grace as a license for us to go and live an ungodly, unrighteous, wicked lifestyle. The last thing God wants to do is to judge a nation. He doesn't want to judge his people. He wants to forgive his people. He wants to save his people. He wants to bless his people. And our wickedness eventually rises up to the throne of heaven and God in his righteous judgment must eventually judge sin. In Revelation, in the New Testament, in Revelation chapter 2, as Jesus was dictating the seven letters to the seven churches that were in Asia, we read this of the church of Ephesus. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. And so you would think, wow, this sounds like a great church. This sounds like a church I would like to be a part of. I would like to be a pastor in a church like this. We have good works. We're laboring. We're patient. We don't bear those who are evil. We've tested false apostles, false prophets, called them out as liars. Uh, you've persevered. You have patience. You've labored. So they're a hardworking church. So you think these guys have it going on. But verse 4, Jesus says this about them. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Some churches in America will say that Christians don't have to repent. You got saved once, you never have to repent again. That's not true according to Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to the churches. And he's telling them to do what? To repent. To turn back to God. Come back and do the things that you did at first. Remember where you have fallen. Repent of the things that you have done that are wrong. Uh, and return and redo those things that you did at the first. I don't know if you were like me when you first got saved. You had this awesome sort of love relationship with God. It was profound how many hours I could spend uh, when I was first saved, on my knees in prayer beside my bed, I would very often, and this is not an exaggeration, fall asleep on my knees praying by my bed and wake up in the morning laying on, on my knees on the bed, leaned over the bed, because I would be praying for hours. And I, that's where I wanted to be. I would spend hours and hours just devouring the Word of God. I couldn't get enough of the Word of God. All I would listen to is worship music. Everywhere I go, I'd want to be reminded of, of the Lord. And so I didn't listen to secular music anymore. I just listened to worship music that edified my spirit. Uh, I got rid of drinking. I got rid of drugs. I got rid of all the things. I stopped cussing. I stopped uh, living a lifestyle of, you know, womanizing or, or, or sleeping around or whatever you want to call it. 
you know, this, this, I was an atheist. So in my early 20s as a stockbroker, I, I was living in the fast lane with people making a lot of money, going to Vegas, partying in Huntington Beach. I was a stockbroker at 21 years old. I was making a lot of money. Uh, and I was an atheist. I'd become an atheist in college. And so I was living really like hell at that time. And, and I didn't want that stuff anymore. When I found Jesus, he satisfied all those things that I was longing for. I didn't want the drugs, the alcohol, the girls. I didn't want any of it anymore. I just wanted more of Jesus in my life. And, and, and perhaps you have a testimony like that. And we have to remember what it was like when we first got saved, that love relationship, that intimacy, that fellowship, that harmonious relationship that we had with God. What happened to that? What happened to that? You see, I'll tell you what happened. The world got in the way between you and God. The flesh, your flesh got in the way between you and God. And if you begin to feed your flesh, your flesh and the appetites of your flesh are going to go stronger. But if you feed your spirit, your spirit man, your spirit woman is going to grow stronger. Whatever you feed will dominate your life. If you feed your flesh, your flesh will dominate you, which is why we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 3, we read here that the first message of John the Baptist, and actually the first message from Jesus Christ, is this, that we must repent. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. So the first message of the church to call the church to become the church was this one word, repent. Repent means to turn away from what you were doing and turn to God. Get off of that path of selfishness and of covetousness and of greed and of lust and of self-pleasure and put your path, your, your feet on that narrow path that leads to life. Get off of the broad way that leads to destruction and get onto the path and enter through the narrow gate that leads to life. As a matter of fact, even Jesus, this was his first sermon in Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, we read that Jesus said this. This is the first message of Jesus. If you have a Bible with the words in red, this is his first message after he was tested in the wilderness uh, for 40 days with uh, Satan. We read in verse 17 of Matthew 4. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. And what did Jesus say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you know there are those who want to actually um, censor the churches to where we cannot call sin, sin, any sin, sin, whether it's fornication, whether it's two people who are living together that never get married, uh, whether it's somebody who's cheating on their taxes, whether it's somebody who's just a perpetual uh, uh, liar and all they, every word that comes out of their mouth, where they, they want to make it to where you can't judge anyone for what they do or say and make it hate speech. And of course, that's going to target the churches is who it's going to target. And it's not going to target most of the churches. It's going to target churches like ours that are sticking to the word of God. So it's a satanic attack against the church to censor us to where we wouldn't be able to even read this from Jesus. We wouldn't be able to tell people to repent because that would be unloving, unkind. It would be mean to tell people they need to repent. That would indicate that they're doing something wrong. And who are you to judge someone else? That's what's coming. That is what they want to bring upon the churches in America. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, we looked at this a little bit over the last few weeks, Jesus says this about the standard that he sets for his people. He says in verse 43 of Matthew 5, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father 
in heaven is perfect. What does that mean? It, it means that we have to keep striving to become more like God, more like Jesus. We can never rest on our laurels. We can never grow comfortable. We can never grow apathetic because the devil is like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. He's at the door. He wants to sift us like wheat, as Jesus told Peter. Peter, don't you know Satan has asked permission of my father to sift you like wheat? He wants to tear you to pieces. Look at what Satan did to Job. He still wants to do the same thing. And so we have to be aware we can't open doors to the devil to let him in. Even through the internet, through your television sets, you must be so careful because the devil will slither right into your house and he will destroy you if you give him a chance, especially as the days grow uh, more and more wicked and darker and darker. As we reject the light, the darkness floods in. Jesus doesn't lower the bar. He raises the bar. He is concerned with our mind. He is concerned with our hearts. He is concerned with our motives. He's concerned with the secret sins, the private sins, not just the outward sins, obviously, but also the secret sins of the heart, jealousy, envy, greed, lust, pride. Those are the things that Jesus is trying to get to. He wants to clean our hearts because if you clean the inside of the cup, then the outside of the cup will be clean also. Otherwise, we're just hypocrites and hypocrisy destroys the work of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, Paul the Apostle says this, and these are some of the scriptures that they want to strike from the record, that they want to call hate speech and get rid of. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators... And fornication would be all sex outside of marriage. The Greek word for fornication is porneo, which would include pornography. He says, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So what is he saying? He's saying you, you can't continue to live as you were. It doesn't really matter what you were doing before you came to Christ. We were all sinners to one degree or another. We all know we're sinners, whether it was outwardly or inwardly, whether it was gross immoral sins or whether it was secret sins or what have you. And he's saying you can't continue to practice these things and think you're a Christian. That's why they want to make this illegal, because it really condemns a whole bunch of people to hell if they don't repent. And people don't want to be told that they're sinful or what their lifestyle is, is sinful. But notice that God includes a whole bunch of people, thieves, people who are covetous, drunkards, revilers, or people who are always wanting to fight with you and pick fights with people. Uh, extortioners, people who cheat people in business, in addition to fornicators, adulterers, and homosexual. So it's not just picking on one group of people. It's, it's, it's really picking on all of us. It's sin. And he's saying, don't be deceived. The unrighteous, those who practice these things, are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. So anybody could be saved. If you're struggling with sexual sin today, you could be saved. You could be forgiven. You could be washed. You could be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But it's not so that you can go right back into that same filthy, perverted lifestyle. You know, it's, Peter says that the pig returns to wallow in the mire after it's washed and the dog returns to eat its vomit. That should not be the case for us as the children of God. Why would we want to go back to roll around in the muck or to go and eat the vomit that we used to live in before we were saved? It makes no sense. It's a total contradiction. In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 6, we read this in verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has has light with darkness? It's a rhetorical question, and the answer, of course, is none. There's no communion between light and darkness. 
the, the light chases the darkness out. They cannot coexist together. So he's saying, just like light and darkness cannot coexist together, righteousness and lawlessness cannot coexist together. Verse 15, he says, And what accord has Christ with Belial? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, chapter 7, verse 1 Having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is the New Testament. This is to the church because the character and nature of God has never changed. God changed. He says, I am the Lord. I change not. He cannot change. He's holy. He's righteous. And he hates sin because sin is a cancer. Sin is a destroyer, and he doesn't want us to be destroyed. He's trying to protect us, and the devil is trying to lie to us and to destroy us. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul the Apostle says this to the church in verse 6. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things come the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience. And he's talking about the sins of the flesh, wickedness and perversion and idolatry and so forth. He says, don't let anyone deceive you with empty words because of these things. The wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Do not partake in it with them. It may exist, but you don't have to partake with them. He says, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light." Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. He's calling to us to awaken. Wake up, church. We need to awaken. We need to understand. We need to shake off this apathy. It's like we've been anesthetized. We've been so desensitized. We've been so shocked by sin, and we're so desensitized. I heard a sermon from Pastor Chuck uh, Smith where he was talking about how it used to be that you would go into, and this was a, a, a sermon he taught, I think, in 2002. It was, it was a year after 9-11, according to what he was talking about. And uh, he said, you know, we used to be shocked when we go into a movie theater and, and, and see a sex scene. And people would get up and walk out. Christians would get up and walk out. Or a nude scene. Uh, or when the name of Jesus Christ would be blasphemed. And, 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 and this, you know, coarse foul language would be there on the big screen and everybody's sitting there and he says you know we used to be shocked and we'd get up and walk out of the theater and say you know what is this world coming to and he says but after a few years you know what we have become desensitized to it and now we can sit through all kinds of filth and all kinds of vulgarity and perversion you see we're becoming desensitized to sin and that's a very dangerous thing because we're called to be separate from the world we read in 2 Timothy and chapter 2 and verse 20. I'm just trying to show you this is a theme not just from the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. Not just to Israel, but also to the church. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul the Apostle says this, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of clay, some for honor and some for dishonor, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness, faith, 
love and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Notice he says it's your job to cleanse yourself daily. That's just taking an account of where you're at with God, repenting of your sins when you sin, and, and, and seeking to do what is right, and sticking close to Jesus, you see. We don't want to keep Jesus at arm's length until there's an emergency, and then we call upon him. We want to walk with him in the cool of the day. What a great privilege to be called God's people, that we have the Spirit of God, the very presence of God dwelling within us, not just outside us with us, but inside of us, by being born again through the Holy Spirit. And he says that, you know, if you cleanse yourself from the latter, from the things of, of, of sin and dishonor, he says you're going to be a vessel of honor. And, and that's the vessel that God is going to fill and the vessel that God is going to use. But a defiled vessel, God cannot really use in the same way as a clean vessel. This is the New Testament. This is, this is the Spirit of the Lord speaking to the church, I believe, in America in the 21st century today. We need to wake up. If we're not scared of what's coming, we should be scared of what's coming because our nation deserves the judgment of God upon it for all of our wickedness, even if it's not you and me doing it. It's still happening on our watch. It's still happening uh, in our generation. Now back to Isaiah chapter 17, where we started God was calling his people back. He was saying, you've forgotten, in verse 10, the God of your salvation. You have not remembered or been mindful of the rock of your stronghold. And the reason they got to that point, Israel got to that point where they had forgotten God, they were no longer, not, no longer mindful of him, is because they went after false gods. In verse 7 of Isaiah 17, in that day a man will look to his maker his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altars, the work of his hands. He will not respect what his fingers have made, nor the wooden images, nor the incense altars. And literally, the wooden images were the Asherim, the uh, uh, Ashtoreth, the Canaanite female deities of sex and of uh, fertility which was basically worshiping lust and worshiping sex. That's what they were doing. They were going after the gods of the nations. This is Israel. This is the nation of Israel. The people of God were going after all these other gods. They were worshiping Baal. They were worshiping, worshiping Ashtoreth. They were worshiping Molech. They were worshiping Mammon. And all of these gods represented different things. They represented sex, power, money, pleasure, the intellect, violence, war, recreation, you see, and so we don't, we don't call these gods, Ashtoreth, Molech, Mammon, but we worship the same things. We worship money, possessions. People worship sex. People worship power. They can never have enough. They just want more. People worship war and violence. Uh, look at all the people beating themselves to death in these cage fights. I mean, we're becoming so desensitized to death and to violence. And I believe if, if God doesn't intervene, we're going to see that death and violence played out in our very streets because we've become so desensitized to it. There's a whole generation that's been raised with this violence and this killing, watching it since the time that they're children. It's not a big deal to them. Zombie movies and all of these things. We have to wake up and be aware of the dangers of being desensitized to the wickedness before it's too late. In Proverbs, the book of wisdom, in Proverbs chapter 1, and I'm going to have to read this here uh, quickly. This is wisdom personified speaking out, crying out to us to hear her voice. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 20. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the openings of the gates of the city, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you, and I will make my words known to you, because I have called, and yet you refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no one regarded, because you have disdained all my counsel, and would have none of my rebuke. 
I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes, when your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. Then they will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and they did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and they despised my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Jesus says, he who has ears to hear Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We have to open our ears to the soft, still voice of wisdom, the voice of God, and then we must obey whatever the Lord shows us. And after we obey that, then he'll show us more, and then he'll show us more. The interesting thing about the Bible, I find that the more I learn about it, the more I don't know, and the more I need to know. It's like inexhaustible as you study the word of God. The treasures go so deep. And and I feel like I'm just now, after being a pastor for 20 years teaching the Bible, kind of getting some sort of a handle on the word of God, some sort of an understanding. But not yet. I need to know more. I need to learn more. uh, Because it's inexhaustible. The treasures of God are inexhaustible. And yet we go after all the, you know, trinkets of the world rather than the eternal treasures of the word of God. We sell out so cheap. Cheaply, God said, my people are sold so cheaply for sin. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll buy into all the drama and all the nonsense uh, of the world, and, and, and we, will, we will deafen our ears to the voice of wisdom. And God says, I'm going to give you what you want. You don't want me, so I'm going to give you what you want, even though it's not what you think it's going to be. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 1, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and to the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I commanded you, nor take from it. You shall not add to the word of God or take away from it, is what he's saying. And the book of Revelation in the last chapter, the last few verses of the last chapter of the book of Revelation, Revelation 22, says the same thing. You shall not add to the word of God, or take away from it. He says that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. For your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them. That means not just knowing, but doing them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people, those who are doing what God commands us to do, he's talking about. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason, we may call upon him. Verse Uh, verse 8 and what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day only take heed to yourselves and diligently keep yourselves lest you forget the things your eyes have seen and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, gather the people to me and I will let them hear my words that they may learn to fear me or reverence me or be in awe of me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. I am the Lord, I change not, God says. It's the same God, the Old and the New Testament. 
It's the same message, although it's a different era, it's a different epoch. The church is not Israel. God still has plans to save Israel, uh, but the character and nature of God will never change. He's the same. He's holy, and he hates sin. In Revelation, back again where we started, uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, And repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The lampstand was actually the light of the church in that local church. Like Jesus was saying, I'm going to snuff out that church of Ephesus if you don't do this, if you don't mind your ways. You must repent, you must remember, you must repent, and you must redo those things that you did at first. It's so interesting that in the book of Revelation, it's almost like an overview of the epochs of church history. And the last two churches actually define the last day's churches. There's one little faithful church called the Church of Philadelphia, and there's the big, popular, lukewarm church, which is called the Church of Laodicea. And as I read this to you, you're going to see, wow, it's like this was written 2,000 years ago, but it actually defines what the church looks like in America today, the lukewarm church. Revelation 3, verse 14. And the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, to the, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, <clears throat> these things says the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, or the one who was there at the beginning at the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And then Jesus says this to us, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And then he talks about how he stands at the door and knocks. And if anyone opens the door, he'll come in with them and sup with them and he uh, with them. So it's amazing here that the lukewarm church sure looks a lot like the church in America today. Rich, has need of nothing, has all kinds of material blessings, material possessions, and yet in reality, they don't stand for anything at all. They're they're lukewarm. Uh, I always think about this when I'm having like a coffee or a tea that gets, you know, you have hot tea and then it cools down and it's lukewarm, and he says, I'm going to, you know, you take a drink, you think it's still hot, and then it's lukewarm, you just want to spit it out, you don't even want to swallow it, or soup, you know, this time of year, we have soup that goes cold, it gets lukewarm, and what do you do? You throw it back in the microwave, or you toss it out and refill your cup of coffee, because lukewarm is just, it's just not it, you don't want a lukewarm cup of coffee, or a lukewarm uh, tea, you want iced tea, or you want hot tea, you want, you know, hot soup, sometimes there's cold soup, but nobody wants lukewarm soup, And so Jesus is trying to make a word picture for us that this is how he sees this church. They're lukewarm and he wants to vomit them out of his mouth. Now, this is the big church. This is the faithless church. This is the compromising church. This is the lukewarm church. Now look at the faithful church, the little faithful church of Philadelphia. Both of these churches are describing the last day's church in verse 7 of chapter 3. And to the church, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. You have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, which is 
shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one may take your crown. This is the little last days church that's faithful. They have just a little bit of strength, but they've kept the word of the Lord. They've not denied his name. Interesting that I think God is even talking about here prophetically about the Reformation movement, those who would call themselves Jews who are not replacement theology. And he's saying those who call themselves Jews, but they're not Jews, uh, he is also going to straighten out. But he's telling us, you know, because you've kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial or testing, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I feel like this is a message from God to us today. He's given us a window. He has opened a door that no one can shut. He says, I provided you an open door that no one can shut. And look, we have all of these decrees coming down from the courts that we have an open door that no one for now can shut because of our Constitution. And so it's time to wake up. It's time to get serious about the work of God and realize that Jesus is coming soon. And to this faithful church, he says what? I am going to keep you from the hour of testing or I believe the tribulation which is to come and judge this whole world. He is going to take us out of here at the rapture uh, because we are his people. And he says that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 and 1 Thessalonians 5.9 tells us that God has not appointed us to wrath, but unto salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have hope. Our hope is to look up as we see these things beginning to take place that were prophesied and predicted all around us, Jesus says, look up, for your redemption draws nigh. Shall we pray? Lord, we ask for your forgiveness here. Lord, I ask for your forgiveness, for I also, Lord, am a sinner, just like all of your people, Lord. We recognize, Lord God, the wickedness of our flesh, the treachery of our minds and our hearts, Lord God. Lord, apart from you, where would we be, Lord? Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the, that it's the kindness of God that brings man to repentance. Lord, help us to remember our first love and to come back to you, Lord, and to turn off the internet and turn off the TV and turn off all of the distractions and sit before you in prayer and sit before you with our Bibles open on our laps, Lord God, and looking to you to speak to us, Lord God, through your word and by your Holy Spirit. Strengthen us, Lord God. Thank you for the open door that you've given us, Lord, for the last day's church. Lord, we pray that we would be faithful to you. We ask that we would be cleansed of the filth of this world, that we might be those vessels of honor, Lord. May we remember that our bodies are your temple. We are the temple of God, Lord. May we remember that everywhere we go, you go with us. For those who don't yet know you, Lord, I pray that you would call them to repentance, call them to salvation, Lord God. Lord, truly, if you could save a wretch like me, you could save anyone, Father. And I know we all feel that way. So, Lord, we ask that you would draw those to yourself to save them in these last days, Father God. May there be a great harvest of souls before the day of trouble that's coming upon this world. Bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.